You're listening to Get to Know World of Warships, a podcast created by Bogsy and Synpax. Ah, welcome back, everybody. It is the age of Deadeye. Thank you all for uh, tuning in, I suppose, to Get to Know World of Warships once again. Uh, I'm here with co-host Borla, and uh, we got a fun. We got a fun episode. We we found. Borla found something cool, and uh, we convinced that cool thing to come talk to us. But um, before we get to him, um, <clears throat> Borla, how have you uh, how have you been finding the, the the age of the safe space in World of Warships, meaning Dead Eye causing everybody to stay back and away from everyone else? It feels like the weekend nonstop now. Like you have <laughs> weekend players Monday through Sunday, and at the end of the game, once they stop worrying about Deadeye, they do anything they can to throw the rest of the match. <laughs> you really think it's that bad, huh? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, it's pretty brutal playing solo right now, so I think it'll be interesting to see if there are any adjustments, if there's any balancing of things. One of the things Wargaming said they wanted to do with this change was give a variety of builds and i think with battleships that's absolutely not accomplished and it'll be interesting to see if they look at what the most popular four point skills taken are and what the least popular are and do some balancing to try to make it uh more of an even mix it, it is pretty funny that the main the main goal is we'd like to create variety and it's like all of a sudden it's like oh well everything takes dead eye because the secondaries suck now because they you know uh superintendent was split and got worse and got more expensive and uh yeah and then there's too many skill there's too many skill points required so it, it's just like they com- they succeeded in the complete opposite unfortunately so that's uh, what it feels like yeah, yeah i uh <laughs> it it must be we were just talking about it before the break that it feels like but week weekend players and it feels like every you can't play without a div now if you want to succeed you have to be divved up with people you trust because otherwise you just don't have the ability to have enough of an effect on the map when all of your battleships go to the corners and to the edges. Yeah, and one of the keys that I've seen playing with and without divs is even if you're a two-man div, you have to have somebody in Destroyer to give you spotting and to do the things necessary that some teammates used to do that just aren't being done anymore. The, 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 the amount of team play feels like it's degraded a lot. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree. I'm, I'm right there with you. Well, um, let's 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 move on. Let's, let's start talking. Let's grab our um, let's grab our guest here because our guest is someone who did something kind of incredible. It was incredible enough that when uh, Borla ran across this person, it it made him kind of go like, "Huh, I haven't seen that in a while." So let's let's go ahead and grab him uh, because he's sitting right here. Brad, how are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> we're good, man. Uh, so we're talking right now with Bedlam Brad, and uh, Bedlam Brad did something that we found to be kind of incredible. Um, Borla, why don't you, since since you're the one who found this fellow, why don't you explain to the guests, my guests, wow, to explain to our audience exactly who and what Mr. Brad is. So... Brad came to me talking to me about our group and wanting to look at getting into some more competitive stuff. And one of the things that he mentioned was the success that his current clan had or previous clan had in clan battles. So I took a look and the clan is looks like an active clan. But if you go to the WoW's numbers pages, the the average PR for the clan is below a thousand. The average win rate's about forty eight point five percent. And even if you sort through, there's not really, you know, some of those clans have some ringers in there and a core core group of competitive players. And then they have a lot of people who get them oil and do other things. This this clan, most of the players are around those averages, you know, a little little above or below. And, you know, it appears to be a casual group of guys. And they made Typhoon last season <laughs> with, with those, that type of play. Yeah, so I was a little impressed. And I started talking to Brad about it. And uh, you and I had a conversation. And I thought it might be worth some people might be interested in what he did to accomplish it, especially if there's other clans that have not been that successful in clan battles and they have a player base that's more casual or less competitive and they want to figure out how they could have a little more clan battle success with that type of talent. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, we, uh, I, I was also astounded just because, as you can imagine, 
I mean, that's a feat. And, and you know, I've, I've been really careful. And Synpax, when he was here as well, has also been really careful. We never want to sort of name and shame people. So uh, I want to just preface right now by saying that, like, as we talk about, you know, about the stasis, uh, stasis, status of, uh, you know, where Brad came from and where Brad's going and whatnot, um, the, the, the purpose is just to is to highlight highlight the the act and to say hey this is really actually an incredible thing that was done here it's certainly not to suggest that anyone isn't good or 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 what have you so um i'd like to just disavow that notion right away if that's okay and um so enough chatter from me brad why don't you just why don't you just give us an idea of you basically in a large degree large part to your work you got a clan that by any metric wouldn't be able to get to typhoon and you got him to typhoon so, how the hell did you do that? Let's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's what we're going to find out today, is how you did that. Um, so, I guess, I guess my first question is going to have to be, I, I suppose, what did you do right? <laughs> be as vain as you'd like, please, because I love vanity. Um, <laughs> I think, I think Yell, Scream, and Holler was, might have been my first. My first one that kind of um, kind of showed my competitiveness a little bit, and it might have uh, you know perked some ears. I guess might have been the making it clear that you were looking to compete more competitively is sort of what what ground it forward. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So, well, I, I have a question, Brad. So before last season, you made it to Typhoon, as we discussed last season. Before last season, was there any activity in the clan around clan battles? Or what was your experience with clan battles? What was the foundation before that season? Um, it was definitely casual, at least from my understanding, um, before last season. I actually joined kind of before the season started. Um, and prior to last season, they'd only made Storm. I think it was more of a casual, you know, maybe end of the end of the season Storm achievement. I'm not really so not you, really entirely certain. But. You mentioned you mentioned specifically that um, you were the one who was the squeaky wheel. You made a noise and you said, "Hey, look." I would like us to get higher, and I would like to be competing at that higher level. <clears throat> and so then, you know, I would assume that folks who could sort of make a choice of like, nah, I don't want to, or yeah, I do, I want to do the same. I mean, did you did you face any sort of pushback when you made it clear that you'd like to actually move up? You'd like to you'd like to push further, push your clan further. Uh, actually, the it kind of happened organically. I don't really, I don't really think anybody kind of pushed back. I think it was more the mentality, you know, it's, let's see how this goes. You know, let's, let, let's give the guy the floor maybe. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. And I, and I got some really good buy-in, I think. Okay. Which was nice. And um, maybe, maybe to get started on the story of it, uh, you know, once, once you decided, Hey, this is something I'm going to put time and energy and effort into, I mean, where did you start? Did you did you start by you know, creating a bit more of an organization under which people could sort of rely on and, and expect? Uh, did you start working with individual people on, hey, I, I really need you to get better at this part of the game? You know, what was what was the first place where you put your energy? Um, I think I think for the most part, it was uh, figuring out, you know, who excelled in what type of ships uh, okay and then from there i kind of you know assigned them you know certain ships that i thought you know, as far as a, from a composition standpoint that we could utilize in clan battles uh, sure and kind of worked off of that so you sort of went like here's what i've got to work with here's what i feel like needs to uh improve Here's what's pragmatic. Would you say something like that? Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. Okay. Were there any specific challenges you ran into 
with that as far as people having ships or what things were the most difficult to get over at the beginning? Uh, we actually were pretty limited as far as what ships we had available. Um, not everybody had every, you know, every tier 10. There were certain ships we were seeing that we didn't have. Uh, the Ohio being one of them, which was one that we saw a lot of. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so how do I mean, what was your approach to sort of overcoming those shortcomings? Did you sort of just kind of go, oh, well... You know, we'll make do with what we can, or uh, did you have something more specific? Uh, I mean, yeah, I'd say kind of made do with what we had, I guess. <laughs> yeah, fair uh, enough. Did I mean, you have guys able to grind those ships? Like, hey, we have lots of Petros. We see lots of Petros. You guys got to grind your Petros. Did you have any, any type of encouragement to those players like that? And if you did, how was that dealt, met with? Uh, we did have... A couple guys that would that kind of work on things like that. I, I definitely, definitely know I made a point to to call that out mid season. But uh. sure. How about um, did you have anybody sort of guiding you or anybody? I, maybe I didn't make this clear at the beginning. I feel looking back in my mind right now and thinking that maybe I didn't. Um, basically, Brad sort of took a clan that was was basically, you know, Gale Storm and was was the driving force towards actually pushing them into uh, Typhoon. So that's why we're probing him with questions to find out what in the hell did he just do exactly. Um, and I'm wondering, did you have any help from outside? Did you, you know, did you reach out? Did anybody give you any advice that, that seemed to work out or help? Did you have any mercs or anything like that? Uh, yeah, Zip. I was pretty fortunate to actually pick the brain of some really good players. Um, and one that I personally lean on for advice. Anyone that you uh, want to uh, single out positively? Because singling out positively is just fine. I'd say I'd give a shout out to Itinerant Cruiser from Yikes or GME as they're now known. Whatever the hell they're calling themselves this week. Yep. <laughs> which, which that was a great name change to GME, by the way. Yeah. I, th I think his, his voice actually helped everyone understand that with the right amount of effort. Um, we could do well by our standards. Um, <clears throat> as far as mercs go, we didn't really utilize that option that much. I think that was most people being prideful um, and kind of deciding that if we were going to, you know, succeed, that we wanted to do it on our own volition. So that was kind of... That's really interesting. Does that mean that, like, when you, when you sort of put the pedal to the metal and said we're gonna we're gonna go forward did it sort of galvanize and energize people along with you to uh to to sort of feel the same way yeah definitely we we talked about it a couple times and i i know i brought it up and that was that was mostly what you know people you know came to decide so i kind of just ran with it you know yeah, and I think the Merc thing, it's interesting the dynamic that can have on teams that are wanting to improve or get better because just like you said about the pride and your guys wanted to do it on their own, in our group there's a pretty big organization and sometimes we'll use Mercs to help train guys up or, hey, we need, we're need short a guy for a, a division in a clan and so we'll pull somebody in. But like progression battles, I, I remember, for instance, when KSD was in their progression battles to Hurricane, they're like, hey, tonight we're, we're no mercs. Like, we want to do this. It's going to be either we pass or fail on our own. And I think you guys doing that on your own, you know, or if you used mercs on some nights to fill out div, it wasn't to bring in a ringer or get you over a hump. I think that really makes your story extra interesting, too, because if you'd had one or two people filling in those spots that were from a hurricane clan or something, that'd be a little different too. Yeah, we definitely, we definitely saw it quite a bit. And I, you know, you'd see a storm lake team with a hurricane league player, which, you know, <laughs> it isn't, you know, we just dealt with it, I guess some, you know, some games we lost cause I could tell, you know, that person was really coaching them up. When you look at the success that you had, getting to typhoon it's a big deal considering you know everything you were working with you had to 
organize, coordinate the players? Like, what was the biggest factor? Was it was it the getting everybody on the same page, or was it teaching them game mechanics or armor schemes or you know kiting versus pushing? What what type of things were most important to you in getting into Typhoon? Um, I think obviously the camaraderie. That's a big thing because. Obviously, I hadn't really played with some of the guys, so they had, they had played with, you know, each other for, you know, multiple seasons or whatever, so, you know, seeing a newcomer come in, you know, they might not, you know, it might have been hard for them, I, I guess. Sure. I mean, did it feel somewhat to you, like, did you ever feel like an outsider? Did you, you said you didn't really get too much pushback. Um, were people pretty grateful that you wanted to actually move in and, and push up? Yeah, they might have been reluctant. I think maybe, maybe some of the guys were a little, you know, taxed from seasons prior. Yes, it is. we all pay the CV tax, uh, emotionally, if not if not financially. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> it's a pretty taxing role, I would say. It it certainly is. Um, well, gosh, so I I'm kind of curious to know, um, you know, one of the things that I found. When I was, uh, I only really started playing competitively in January of last year, I would say, um, right before COVID hit. And uh, one of the things I found the most useful for me when I was playing, I was put into a team with folks that were more experienced and competitive. Um, they very kindly drew up strategy maps for me of like, hey, here's where these boats go. Here's what they do. And here are three or four basic considerations that I should should make while I'm playing the game um, but it was the, the fact that it was a map meant that I could literally on my second monitor I could refer back to it anytime I wanted so if ever I had a question or a, a doubt or a wonder I could go oh, where am I supposed to be what's going on I could look and go right that's what our plan is that's what our strategy is um, did you create like a strategy or did you sort of just fly by the seat of your pants as the game unfolded I think generally uh, we worked off a pretty general strong side push and weak side hold for most of the season. Occasionally I would shift like one or two ships based off what we were seeing. What uh, Was there any strat in particular that <clears throat> you ran into a lot that caused you caused you a lot of a lot of frustration or anything that you sort of remember and go, ugh? I think actually the one of the most frustrating strategies was uh, we would see the Hakuru CV, and then a bunch of fire starters. Oh, really? Two, Goliath, two Goliaths was one of them. Sure. I, I'm kind of curious. Sorry to run over. Uh, I don't mean to run over you, Borla. I'm just curious, though. Like, at obviously, you guys must have played a whole bunch of games in Storm in order to, um, you know, progress up into Typhoon. So, what was the most common strat uh, or lineup that you guys faced in, you know, in in Storm? Because I I'm kind of curious to know if it looked like what uh, what the Upper Typhoon Hurricane lineups looked like. I'd say we'd see Halland or Smalland, as far as DD goes, and then we'd either see two battleships, uh, Montana Krim, Ohio Kremlin. As far as cruisers go, Petro, Stalingrad. Sure. Maybe Mosfa occasionally, but I think people generally are afraid to play that ship in competitive. Well, uh, there's a carrier, hell yeah. Yeah. Um, and then if we've seen you know, a carrier, it was typically the, the FDR or the MVR. Yeah, and one of the things that I always find interesting is the people side of this. And, you know, maybe Bogsy has some comments. Maybe, Brad, you have comments, but the social side is you're trying to push and you're going through sometimes you'll hit a wall with something and you have to make adjustments and the frustration that guys have i feel like to get where your clan got or probably just below that you know i think what you guys did exceeds this but if people can get the social side down which to me means hey we're coordinated we know if we're not playing all four nights, we know which nights we are playing. Guys get there at a set time, whether it's the beginning or a different set time, and we know who's going to play, and guys aren't complaining about playtime, and guys know what ships they're going to be in and what comp we're going to run. 
stuff like that, I believe for even a more casual clan can get them into storm. If they, if they have say eight or 10 hours a week of, of productive clan battles time. And even if they're not highly competitive or highly skilled players, if they're coordinated and they're willing to put in, you know, like I said, those eight or 10 hours, maybe a little more a week, I think they can get into storm just based on being socially aligned, you know, like, like all having the same goals and working together. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, I'm a little congested. Um, I, I always have this feeling that like, just playing enough will get you out of out of squall league like all you you don't even have to be you don't have to be particularly skilled if you have a team that gets together every day at clan battle time and plays for two hours you'll make it out of that league eventually um you know gale league is a little different i, I feel like you you sort of need to understand you need to not just play you need to be able to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each individual ship even if you don't have an over you know an over uh, overarching strategy yet you need to sort of go okay well I've noticed that my Hindenburg dies to the battleships way too much and the Petro doesn't maybe we'll take more Petros and then suddenly your lineup starts to become a little more meta focused based on what's going on but you can still you know you can get to Gale doing that but to Gale to Storm you need to have competent you know you need to have competent players who know how to use their ships properly even if you still don't have an overarching strategy. But to get from Storm to Typhoon, I, I truly don't think you can do that without going, okay, we're going to have, you know, a 4-2 four, a four two split, and the carrier is going to focus on, if it's a carrier season, of course, the carrier is going to focus this side or try to take out this person. You sort of need to go into the battle knowing we have a an aim, and we're going to take the initiative. Otherwise, I feel like you're just not going to be able to make the win rate you need to make it through into Typhoon. I guess, Brad, did you have a comment on like the social side of it? How much of it you think that was a factor and just the guys all being willing to work together? I mean, I, I definitely say, you know, having some common personalities in the clan as far as the same interests that goes a long way towards, you know, the social side. Was your clan one that, um, was your clan one that, I mean, did they div up a lot in randoms? Did they do operations together? Did they try to do clan battles before? I'm, I'm kind of curious as to whether this, you know, this group effort was made solely at your, um, you know, at your insistence in a way. <laughs> uh, I think if I remember correctly, we did do some operations. It wasn't everybody, but, you know, there was... There are certain guys that definitely like to div versus you know others that don't. So <clears throat> yeah, see, see, and to Boxy's point earlier, I believe if you have one person like Brad who understands some things and can explain the basics, I think I, I think Boxy, you and I might have a little different viewpoint on this. I think you can get a lot further, not even if most of your players don't understand armor schemes maybe they're even making bad ammo choices or angles but if you have one person who can put them in the right ships in the right place and then be organized i really feel like some of the clans that are struggling the piece that they're missing is around the social side and around getting the guys on you know on during clan battles getting them organized having a schedule getting people to cooperate with playtime. You know, if you get nine guys on and you can only play seven, how are you going to do the rotations and people having clear expectations and having them met? I think I think that's the part that the lower end clans should work on if they have one or two people who can tell the person in the Petra they shouldn't be nosing, they should be kiting or, <laughs> you know, stuff yeah. like that. And, and putting them on the right side or you know, a caller that can say, hey, this is what we're focusing right now. I don't care what your best shots are at. Everybody shoot at this if you have them. Right. Like like one person like that or two people like that, I think, can can carry a, a an organized group of casual players in, into Storm. Well, I think that's what we just saw. <laughs> I think that's I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, I think that's yeah. That's the, the whole typhoon part Brad did. That's a good that's a higher bar. But he that. That, that, that's why I find this found this interesting that 
I mean, maybe some of the people who have been in clans that are consistently Storm or have not made it into Storm and Storm is their goal, that's an area to really focus on. If you have one or two people who are making the comps, making the strats, and helping not make catastrophic decisions as far as pushing or kiting and doing the right thing at the right time, that you can take more casual players or mechanically less skilled players and still have quite a bit of success. And I'm I'm guessing Brad and his teammates, like when you got that progression battle through Typhoon and you, you saw that Typhoon color pop up, I'm sure that was a very satisfying feeling after the amount of time and effort you guys put in. That was definitely a nice achievement. Did you uh, did you celebrate with some uh, sparkling cider? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about the cider part. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I mean, did anything once you got those green tags? I'm kind of curious. Did anything you know? Did anything change? Did uh, did anything change socially around the clan? I mean, at that point, I think obviously the the camaraderie was was there, you know, clan wide. And I think generally people were excited. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> You know, I was just thinking specifically because you know, we were talking about what works in <clears throat> Storm and whatnot and what doesn't, and uh, the 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 fact of whether there's a CV or not in the in the you know in the season in the rules of the season makes such a huge difference. Um, I, I I'm excited for this next season because of the fact that there's no CV. Now I, I realize that might be a shock to everybody listening. Oh my God, no CV! Bogsy's excited. Well, yeah, I mean it's. The CVs really, really, really. I think they tighten what's possible in the in the game during competitive seasons when uh, when there's a CV. I, I just think it reduces the number of options drastically. So I can't. I don't know about the rest of you all listening, but I'm thrilled at the idea of having uh, a tier ten clan battle. Excuse me, tier nine clan battle season with no CVs. I thought that the uh, the Verizon tournament was a great example of just how much fun and how. Uh, I'll just say it. How fun and engaging the game can be if, uh, you know, quite frankly, if there are no CVs constantly spotting and constantly punishing players that are attempting to make a move. Um, you know, did, I am kind of curious, Brad, to know if, you know, did you have enough CV players who were competent? Did you feel like it was more or less difficult on any given night, depending on who you had available to play CV? Um, we actually had one CV player uh, for the majority of the season. Then we picked up another one, but our new guy kind of ran with the second div. Um, as far as being difficult, I definitely, th I definitely think the CVs definitely had a huge effect over the game. Uh, so if you didn't have one, then it was going to be difficult. Yes. Did you at any time try yeah. to run double battleship? Uh, we did. At the beginning of the season, for sure. Um, and then you realize the only way to beat Sky Cancer is with Sky Cancer? Essentially, yes. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm not supposed to say that. I'm not supposed to say Sky Cancer. Apparently, Wargaming <laughs> doesn't like it if you refer to CVs that way. Oops. I think that can get you chat banned in-game now if you do that. I don't yeah, know. And, yeah. and I know there were some people who tried without a CV, and I think you artificially raise the necessary skill floor if you are going to try it without a CV. Like, you know, I think in past seasons, maybe Kraken had some good success without a CV comp, but very few clans can push, you know, through to the top of Typhoon and above without really good CV players. And I, Bogsy, like you, I, I think this season will be very interesting at Tier 9. I think some of the other things that they've talked about, they mentioned in one of the official Twitch streams that there could be ship limits, there could be a limit of two of any given ship in a lineup, that there could be times throughout the season where a particular ship is limited to only one, or certain ships are completely banned for a limited time. I'm also interested in how soon they're going to give us the final info, right? So we've had these dates for a couple of weeks. <laughs> right. We know it's tier nine. We know it's seven V seven. We really don't know anything. They kind of teased all of those things, but a lot of us, especially some of us who 
put a lot of preseason time and effort into what we're going to do are really still waiting to be able to to decide what we want to do with this season based on if the two ship uh, per lineup is going to be a real thing. You know, I think that'll really impact because of the way DDs at tier nine could be very strong. If you could have a pack of three or four of the same DD versus, Hey, you're only going to be able to have two. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to the three to four Mogador, you know, running yeah. around comp. I'm, I'm really not looking forward to that, but uh... I'm a huge fan of the limit of two of any given ship. I really think that, will make comps more interesting and will give a higher variety of what you'll see at a competitive level like you i think there's going to be some some like we saw with uh clubbers or like we saw at tier eight when when we had the tier eight you know packs of dds so i think that yeah. two ship limit could really make with some interesting stuff at tier nine yeah i think so too and brad tell me tell me which one if you had to choose which one would you prefer um they said that they they might introduce a, a limit of two ships of any one type. They said they might go one ship of any one type, or they and they said they very likely will be uh, introducing sort of a a rotating ban on certain ships. My guess is the ones that show up to be problematic. Of those three options, Brad, I mean, what do you think would feel best to you in a in a match scenario? Um, well, if I'd base it off of last season's. Clan battles, I'd say limiting it to one, one of each ship type. Yeah. Just because, as you guys said, the variety of what we're going to see. I think, I think games, you know, if I use last season, for example, where there was four Petros in a div, you know, it's, it's realistically, you should be able to plan ahead as soon as you see that on what you're going to be able to do. That's, it's kind of predictable in that sense. Um, I think that generates more fun realistically if you have, you know, some on the fly decision making as far as, okay, well, we see this, you know, this ship, this, this ship and this ship, yeah. you know, what are we going to do? It's going to, it's going to be a lot more fun, I think. Yeah, certainly. You know, it's funny the the brawls, I, I was actually a, a really annoyed with the brawls in December where they had five days of five hours each time. So I was just like, oh, that's so much um, to the point where it got obnoxious. But I, I think also the three V with the tier nine, three V three on tiny maps, including two brothers um, that that pissed me off, too. I just thought that was someone should have known. I, I had how that my was gonna favorite. Go. I had my favorite match of all of clan brawls on two brothers, three V three tier nine. What is wrong with you? It was it was glorious because we were we were tied with the other team and I'm not going to name and shame we were tied with the other team they had much more health than we did and like 12 minutes in they decided to make an unnecessary push and which allowed us to win like at the last second when they should have just held off for a draw and it was all because they were just overly anxious after they had been patient for like 10 12 minutes like all parts blocking you like you do on two brothers with that but I think the three v to me the three v three clan brawls, or back when they did the four v four and you used to have to have one of each class, mm -hmm. like those are the funnest because it's so different than the other competitive. It's a lot less serious. They're generally fast matches. Like those are glorious, Bogsy. I, I'm inclined to agree. And actually, I I really enjoyed the tier eight clan brawl uh, that happened last week, and. Uh... I'm looking forward to the Tier 10 Clan Brawl that starts this week, even though I thought it started last Wednesday, uh, two days ago, because I'm an idiot. But, um, you know, it, during the Tier 8 one, my my teams that I played with, we never we never repeated a ship, uh, except maybe the battleship. I think for a while there, we were taking two Lenins or two Vlads, or, um, but generally speaking, we would have... You know, we brought, since it's tier 8, we brought a North Carolina for the accuracy. Um, we brought a Lennon for the tankiness. We Then we'd bring, you know, a Mines, a Baltimore, um, a Chapayev, and a couple of different DDs. Like, we'd, we we found a use for everything. And because there was no carrier, nothing, things could spread out, things could operate on their own, and then disappear if they wanted to, which you just can't really do in a CV season. So... You know, we, we, we changed up a little bit when we kept running into the uh, the multi multiple French DD comps, and then you just need to have enough 
you need to have enough ships with fast, uh, with high velocity guns just in order to hit them, which was annoying because it's like, all right, well, we gotta we gotta adjust for this. But um, it was a delight because you could take what you wanted, and if your players were skilled enough, like we were talking about earlier, if they were skilled enough at that ship, you could just find a way to make it work. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that during the Tier 9 season. Um, I don't know, do, do either of you, maybe Brad, we can start with you, are there any ships you think are going to be <laughs> maybe overrepresented, like in Alaska, or uh, we, we talked about Mogador a second. Does anything sort of strike you immediately as like, ah, oh, that could be a problem? Um, I would definitely say the Alaska would be probably the number one choice for cruiser. The Mogador would be another one. As far as DD goes, yeah. I, what about you, Borley? You think there's anybody that's going to be a it's going to be a, a commonplace criminal this season? Yeah, I think it's really going to come down to those rules we talked about. The Alaska and Mogador are obviously two easy ones. We've had uh, some mad scientists talk about Yolo Palos. Oh yeah, you know there's some there's some interesting choices out there depending on what the bands and limits are. I think that's going to have the biggest, how that all breaks out is going to have the biggest impact on this season. <laughs> I forgot about the Paolo Emilio. I feel like, I, you know, before we, before we wrap up here, I, I, I will remind everybody that um, the Verizon tournament, it was, no, it, wasn't, it was King of the Seas. King of the Seas, the international part of King of the Seas was really astounding because that was the first time I'd ever really seen Russian teams um, in a competitive format. And I had I had sort of heard whispers that oh well the, the Russians are just extraordinarily aggressive with their strategies and play style, and brother they did not disappoint. There were so many matches where, um, I'd, I'd watch I watched legendary Kleberes rush battleships and you know they they just relied on that uh, damage saturation to not get blapped so they they'd lose three quarters of their health but they would just completely. YOLO and kill like a battleship parking around a corner because they could they just run around the corner and with the legendary mod suddenly they have good concealment their guns are useless but they have really good concealment they would literally just be suicide boats they'd rush to a cap with speed boost take the cap before the other team got the cap and then they'd find a battleship or a heavy cruiser to YOLO and I just went holy shit that's it's so matter of fact you know it's like it's I it's sort of like somebody was like, oh, well, what do we do with the, uh, you know, what do we do with the clever? Well, it's easy. You need to just take cap first and then kill something. If you live, great. Take another cap. Kill something else. You know, like, oh. Rocky Rocky Four. if he dies, he dies. Yeah, if he dies, he dies. <laughs> What's that? What's the, uh, Torino and I were joking about it the other day. What was the, um, I think it was in Enemy at the Gates, that movie with uh, Jude Law where, you see the scene where it's like, first man gets a rifle, second man gets a magazine. When the first man falls, the second man picks up the rifle. You know? Yeah. It, it really no, felt just, like that. I think that's what will be, if they don't do the limits, I think that's what we'll be stuck with. If they do the limits, I think we'll have a really interesting season. Yeah. I mean, with no carrier, you might literally see teams of Paolo Emilios that, you know, hey, Hit that boost, get to the contested caps first, outgun any DD that's there, and then, you know, launch yourself at, at whatever cruiser, heavy cruiser, is dumb enough to be there, whether it's a Kron or an Alaska or whatever. They're not going to kill you fast enough before you get your torps off. So, I don't know. It well, might, yeah, and that's, you might see it for the, a while. The radar at Tier 9 is what will be interesting to see with any smoke comp like that because some of the longer-range radar ships are not ones you would take due to any other strength some have short radar or shorter duration radar so it's going to be interesting to see where the rock paper scissors falls and i think i think if they do the two ship limits throughout the entire season that we'll see a much much greater variety of comps than we've seen in quite a few seasons and i think that would be the most interesting thing for everyone involved i also hope that um so let, let, let's wrap ourselves up here. Um, Brad, I want to ask you to do something that we, we often do on the show, which is we'd like to ask you to sink a ship. Um, I know I didn't give you I didn't give you a heads up that this was a this was a part of the uh, format, but basically 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you sub Octavian for the day. The guy who's more or less in charge of running things. And uh, I'm going to ask you to take your uh, take your your big brain access card that only a few people get. Go down into the vaults of wherever their vaults are. Maybe Cyprus. I don't know. <laughs> you're going to you're going to enter the mainframe and you're going to delete a ship. It's gone. Nobody knew where it was. Then you're going to brainwash the entire gaming community into believing that it never existed. It's going to be like uh, Orson, is it Orson Welles? Oh, I'm so dumb. Orson Welles or George Orwell's 1984. Sorry. College was a long time ago. George Close. Orwell's 1984. If it's anyone closed. even mentions it, their head's on the chopping block. What ship? What ship is getting sunk, Brad? I mean, that's a pretty... <laughs> I think that's a pretty easy choice. <laughs> What's it going to be for you? Especially after the the commander updated thunder by four. Oh, the thunder! You don't think it added variety to have four thunders with dead eye on each side on every team? No, absolutely not. <laughs> no, no. I, God, it. You know, I actually, I think I can say this is that it's it's no surprise that uh, you know after I got made a community contributor, I got access to the community contributor Discord, and that afforded me a certain amount humble brag that um. That sort of afforded me an opportunity to see how feedback is given directly to wargaming, um, and I can also say that it got me, it got me the opportunity to find out how they receive the the info, um, and how they receive that feedback, and how they sort of handle that in a more personal environment. Um, and I will say that one of the things that I've struggled with is knowing how to make a point about. I want to say, hey, look. It, Deadeye is responsible for something I've noticed, which is battleships sit at the back of the maps now, and they don't push objectives because they seem to feel as if if Deadeye is not operating, somehow they're going to fail. So they stay away, so they never have Deadeye deactivated. But I don't know how to make an argument for that. I don't know how to support that argument with objective facts or... Um, you know, with data. So okay, I have I a suggestion. That. Please. So I have a suggestion on this. Actually, I was having a conversation with a couple guys in KSE about this this morning. Part of what Wargaming said over and over again with this captain's skill rework was that they wanted there to be a variety of choices and a variety of builds that you could take. So objectively, I would think a piece of data that they should look at is how many battleships run dead eye as a four point skill they should be able to look at that as a percentage right so of all and and you could do it by tier you could look at just tier 10 or the higher tiers but how many battleships are being outfitted with dead eye what percentage that is and then go look at some of the skills like improved secondary battery aiming close quarter specialist uh emergency re repair expert how many are being run with that they should easily be able to see and especially focus around the four point skills but you could balance other skills this way too what's the percentage and i think if their goal if it's true that one of their main goals was to make a variety of builds by definition the four point skills should be relatively equal in usage right like right. there, there may be something that's stronger or weaker, but if the goal is to say there's a variety of builds, especially at the four point level, also at the three point level, you should be able to go through there and say, hey, a lot of players uh, are are running this and this, but a lot of players are also running that. And it's kind of, you know, you have have six skills there and, and there's people who are choosing two or three across the board. I think in reality, you're going to find and, and you'd have to do it by games played in that ship, not necessarily, you know, by the amount of players, unique players, but games played the number of games played with bat with dead eye and battleships is got to massively outweigh every other skill. And then they should take a look at that and say the one or two skills that are used the most and the one or two skills that are used the least probably need nerfed and buffed respectively. Holy crap! Um, this is uh, this actually. I just got a ping while we were talking here that apparently, uh, I just got a ping from the Cots Discord that, I guess. I guess 
it, it sounds like from what I'm gathering, the EU, yep. the COTS EU orgs are moving on to other things and won't be part of the tournament anymore. We've organized COTS in collaboration with Wargaming to this point. They'll be taking over from now on. The tournament will go on, just not with us running it. Uh, they oh. they okay. sold the Discord and the tournament to Wargaming. <laughs> wow. Do you remember when we talked about the Verizon tournament, Bogsy? Yes. And I said, expect Wargaming to be more involved in this? Yes. Yes, I do remember this, that. This doesn't totally surprise me. I mean... I mean, well, I think I know what we're talking about next week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... Um... But, to, but to circle back on the point skills, I mean, do you have any thoughts on that, Bogsy? Like, like looking at that hard data, which we don't have access to, but Wargaming has their magic spreadsheet. Like, that should be an easy way to see, are we achieving our goal of having a variety of builds that are usable in this ship? Logically speaking, yes, that would be the correct way to do this. Here's my next thought. And this is something that will take probably six months at minimum for Wargaming to collect enough data for them to feel like they, you know, a mosaic that says something actually comes out of it. But like, I, I sometimes make the reference that I would say 5% of the Wargaming, Wargaming, of the World of Warships player base is what I would call good. Um, maybe that's being a like little... competitive, understands all the game concepts, understands yes. what skills are choosing dialed into the greater community meaning stuff that's going on reddit yeah. forums other voyeurs i may have Discord. just outed myself yeah. as a giant dick for saying the word good but like what i really mean by that is is it has the serious. inclination to optimize the builds right um You're serious about the game more serious about the game yes so what i wonder then is the data that they get is going to be heavily heavily weighed on folks who may not realize that uh, well, quite frankly, some of these skills are really, really bad. Like, heavy AP for battleships is, I, I almost want to say it's outright a negative. It's, it's they should give you points back if you take that. <laughs> I mean, so so I sort of wonder, I feel like one like, like heavy AP for battleships, which literally increases your fire and flooding times. Um, By 30%. For a negligible increase in AP damage. I feel like that's bad enough that most people will even look at that and go, oh, uh-uh, 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 no, 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 I don't want that. Um, so that one might be so bad that it gets the axe no matter what. But I feel like there are some other ones that are just sort of like, eh, whatever, that people won't realize are not are really not worth it, are not optimal. And yeah, so I, I agree. And so they'll be taken by that other 90 95% of the player base at higher levels than they should um, to, to show their usefulness. I mean, do, do you ever worry about that? Yeah, I, I agree that that will go on with some skills. I would say anecdotally in the games played that I've had and everybody that I've talked to has had, and I think probably you two have had, how many battleships do you think are taking Deadeye? Like what percentage of battleships that enter the game take Deadeye? Correct. I would say probably 90%. So in looking at the data that I described, I think the worst outliers would still statistically show up they'd be at the edge, edge yeah. of the curve yeah i think you know we're gonna find dead eye is a massive massive amount of players no matter what <laughs> which means that it shouldn't be the way it, that, that if you're if part of your primary focus is having a variety of builds that are usable that something different needs to happen with that skill yeah you know it's interesting because they they've said sometimes when they adjust skills or whether they re-tier the skills, so to speak, they sometimes will do so based on the fact they say it was ubiquitous. They bumped up uh, priority target from one point to two points because they said there was no reason not to take it. It was just too good. They Correct. bumped, um, they mentioned that, you know, concealment was one of those things where it was just too good. I don't, they didn't change it, but, um, you know, they have said before that it's just consistently very, very good. I actually... I would argue now that there's there's some precedent for not taking concealment on battleships more often than before, uh, even with Deadeye. I know that Deadeye and, and concealment synergize, um, but I, I really think that there's there's actually a precedent to say, well, if you're at long range, Deadeye is great. But as you move forward towards the cap circles, you don't need it. What you really need is you need survivability. Um, yeah, I, I do see... So I see an argument for the second and third four-point skills, mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying. 
dead eye i think almost everybody is taking whether you then take concealment and fire prevention or you take emergency repair expert and fire prevention or you know what choices you make after dead eye depending on the ship and your play style i do think there are arguments for those secondary skills being different and i don't think there's always a right or wrong answer the same way taking dead eye is the right answer sure but i you know really unless you're just doing it for the memes are you going to go with a full secondary build with these four point skills with two secondary four point skills no no yeah, you're so, not <laughs> so by my by my argument what i think the data would show is that dead eye would be far and away the most often used four point battleship skill I think improved secondary battery aiming and close quarter specialist would probably be the two least used. Yeah. I'd argue too that they're used more often than they even should be because there are some people who just love their secondaries and they're going to do it either out of ignorance or just wanting to meme. <laughs> but me. you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> they're going to be used more than they should be, but they're yeah. still going to be the two that are trailing the most. Yeah. And so if you want a variety of builds, Dead Eye has to change a lot or be replaced by something completely different. Yep. And if you want secondary builds to be viable, and I'm not saying they should be, but if that's where gaming's goal, then those two would need to be buffed as well. Yeah, fair enough, man. Fair enough. Well, um, we've we've been chatting for a long time here, um, so why don't we wrap up? Um, Brad, Bedlam Brad, thank you very much for joining us and giving us a little insight onto what it's like to sort of hack and slash your way through the World of Warships jungle, you know, looking for the lost city of, uh, of Typhoon. We appreciate it very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much very much for having me yeah absolutely yeah thank, thanks well, a lot brad thank you obviously uh, as always for coming and co-hosting and uh and chatting with me it's uh, always a pleasure my pleasure great so um yeah let's uh i'm looking forward i think we're gonna have to talk to to or about uh cots next week becoming property of wargaming which is a uh, that's a big deal um so i'll see i'll see if i can't get a wargaming employee to actually come on and and tell us what they can about it um, so I'll, yeah, I'll... I just wanted to mention one thing, though, Bogdan, as we close out, because you talked about the humble bragging and being a CC and whatever. <laughs> and yes. I wanted to make sure that all of your listeners knew that you'd been an actor. Uh, yes, I, I have you mentioned that. I, I just I, want to make sure I did. I have. I this I may it might have been the only episode it wasn't mentioned. You know what I, I should sure do? I should call Synpax right now and uh, let him know that I was because I don't know if he ever heard it. That That was a joke in his honor. <laughs> Uh, yes, humble brag is uh, is a skill, and it's hopefully one that I've I've honed well over the years. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, clan uh, clan battles are coming up uh, at the end of February. Everybody should check those if you're into clans and clan battle uh, you know activities. Um, other than that, tier ten clan brawl starts next week. Brawl is a great way to get to know people in your clan that you don't know yet. It's a great way to find out who is forward thinking and capable of leading a team like Brad here. And, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a good, like Borla was talking about, it's a really good social opportunity to, you know, invest in getting to know the folks um, better, you know, who you maybe didn't before. So um, thank you, as always, everybody, for uh, listening to Get to Know World of Warships. I appreciate it very much. We'll see you guys next week.